So uh, my subject today is praying in hope. I have several scriptures that I'll reference. I'm not going to read all of them, but I will, I will reference them. And so um, I'm going to go back and read Romans. I'm going to start from verse 12 this time. So this is going to be Romans 15, verse 12 through 13. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, and again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for calling me to be here with your people. Now hide me behind the cross. Let your Holy Spirit speak. Let me articulate the message that you've given to me well. Let it ruminate in their minds and in their hearts that they would walk out of here feeling lighter, God, that they would walk out of here feeling hope, Father, that they would walk out here feeling peace, even in our sorrow, even in our grieving, you are faithful to us. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I was 31 when I got married. I may have to take this off of here. Well, we're going we to see. Okay, there we go. Um, I was 13 when I, I mean, I was 31. <laughs> Lord Jesus, Father, help me. I'm going to move this over just a little bit. And y'all just work with me. This is my first time speaking before a church, and so I am a bit nervous, as you probably can imagine. But I remind myself that I stand and teach before people every Friday. So God has given me some, some abilities. All right, thank you. So anyway, I was 31 when I got married. And I guess you can call me a late bloomer. I expected to be married by about 25, and that just didn't happen. And I met this beautiful man in my late 20s, and we got married a little while after. And we had our first daughter, Olivia, who's sitting here. I was 33. And then when I got pregnant again with Layla at 35, I was excited and went to the doctor, and she said, okay, Audrey. Well, this pregnancy is going to be a little different. I said, well, why is that? She said, well, this is called a geriatric pregnancy, also known as advanced maternal age. I said, well, first off, that's a little rude, okay? And, <laughs> and what does this mean? And it just simply meant that when a woman gets pregnant at 35 or older, we're at higher risk for complications in pregnancy. And so God blessed me to have a healthy pregnancy. And Layla's here now, healthy and well. And so, um, you know, a few months after Layla was born, maybe she was about six months old, um, I had gone to church. And so I had both my babies with me. Olivia was three and Layla was six. And one of the mothers at the church said to me, I told her, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm trying to manage two children. This is a lot. And she said to me, well, you know, God will do it for you. She encouraged me. And then she said, well, you know you're going to have a son. I looked at her. I said, lady, <laughs> I just told you. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed with two, and now you're telling me God's going to give me three children? And she said, indeed, he is. From that word that was given to me, it's been five years. Layla's five today. And over that time, I have had five miscarriages. And so with that, it, it, I, I can't even ex describe to you the amount of hope I have to have in a place of sorrow, right? And so why am I telling you this story? Because even to this day, God is still telling me I'm going to have this son, right? And even though I may have suffered such loss, and at times I still feel like I'm grieving, God is faithful. I look at these beautiful children right here, and I remind myself that though it doesn't look like what I thought it would look like, he can do it again. Okay? And so today we're talking about praying in hope. How do we do that? 
So in, in, back in Romans 15 on verse 12, and it's, it says, in Jesus, the Gentiles will hope, right? That's us, all of us who are non-Jews. The Gentiles will hope. And then it goes on to say in 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all hope. So our hope comes from God, right? So this is my first point. You have to trust God in order to have hope, right? That's where we start. And so we start, we can start that by focusing on gratitude, right? So sometimes things happen in our lives. We have losses. Maybe it's a loss of job. It may be loss of a family member. It may be loss of your identity and who you thought you were. It may be a loss of your plan for what you thought was for your life. But we can always reflect on God's faithfulness to give us hope. So I'd like for y'all to do me a favor right now. I want you to think in your mind about three things that you are grateful for. Three things you're grateful for. It can be a person. It can be something, tan you know, something physical that you have, your home, your, your friendships, your house, whatever it is. But I want you to get those three things in your mind. I hope you have them. And so now think about in those three areas, how has God been faithful to you? Think about that. How has he been faithful to you? So as I reflect on looking at my family, three of the things that I'm grateful for are sitting here in the sanctuary. And I think about God's faithfulness that we're all still here. I'm here. I have my husband. We have our children. And so that helps me remember that even in my sorrow, God has been faithful to me, right? And that's what encourages me, and that's what gives me hope. So when we talk about praying from a place of hope, we have to start with the faithfulness of God. The writer of Hebrews, of Hebrews describes faith as, and this is in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So do you see that? Our faith is comprised of things we hope for that we haven't seen yet. The three things that you reflected on, I hope you were able to identify where God has been faithful to you. And so no matter where you find yourself today, an unexpected place of grief, I pray that God reminds you that he's faithful and that he gives each of you peace. Amen. So my second point is, how you wait matters. Yeah. How we wait matters. Some of you in this room may be waiting for something from God for a long time, right? I told you I've been waiting about five years. Some of you may be waiting on a healing. Some of you may be waiting on a child to be delivered. Some of you have been waiting for a long time. The important thing about how we wait, are we waiting with anticipation to see how God is going to answer? Or are we mumbling and complaining? And listen, that's not a judgment because I've complained. I have complained. But are we, are we mumbling and complaining? Are we thinking about how good God is? Or are we worried about what's not happening in our timeline? I think about the children of Israel when they were taken out of Egypt and on their journey to the promised land. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, and I will read it. It says, it, it, it takes 11 days to go from Harab to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Sur Road. In the 14th year of the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. So what should have taken them 11 days to go from the wilderness over to the promised land, instead it took them 40 years. Can you imagine that? You've been praying on something that could have taken 11, 11 days. And because we're complaining, we're delayed. Right? And so when we think about how we wait, it's important for us to not grumble and to complain, but to reflect on God's faithfulness 
and what he has done. And I think sometimes we judge the Israelites. We, we judge them a little bit about how they were in the wilderness, right? And some stuff I think is worth judging. Their abandonment of God and worshiping other gods. And also, they were tired. They were tired. They were thirsty. They were hungry. And they had forgotten everything that God had done. They forgot that he parted the Red Sea. When they were thirsty, they forgot that God cleaned the water so that they could drink. And then what do we do in our time of difficulty? Do we forget? Sometimes we may forget what God has done. We can't see the bigger picture, but we zero in on where we are at the time. So my encouragement there for you is wait with anticipation that God is going to answer you. And remember his faithfulness as you wait. Again, it's okay to complain because that's normal, but don't stay there too long, okay? I think about Elijah in 1 Kings, and I'm just going to read the verse. I'm going to tell you that where you can find the verses, but I'm not going to read it. But in 1 Kings chapters 18, verses 36 through 45, as well as 1 Kings chapter 16 through 17. So let me set some context. So here, the prophet Elijah is praying and asking God to bring rain. Now, in the previous chapter, Ahab had become the king, had become king, and he was creating an, um, an altar to Baal. And so Isaiah prayed that the Lord would shut up the heavens and that no water would come. So now there was no rain for three and a half years. There's no water for their animals. There's no water for them, for their crops. And so he now prays to God and asks God for rain. He sends his servant out to look for rain. And the servant goes out seven times and he comes back and says, there's nothing there. But on the seventh time, he comes back and he says, there is a small cloud the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And Elijah tells Ahab to go. Rain is coming. Get in your chariot and go. Elijah focused on God's faithfulness. The same God that he prayed to for fire to come down and kill the prophets of Baal. The same God that he prayed to to shut up the heavens so rain wouldn't come. He knew that even though they kept looking and they didn't see anything, that God heard his prayer and that God would be faithful. Right? So he knew that God would show up. And so for you, whatever you're waiting on, my encouragement to you is to keep praying. Keep waiting for it. Though it may tarry, it will come. Though you may not see it, remember what God has already done in your life. Because he will answer you, just like he did with Elijah. Elijah is praying to the same God we pray to. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Okay? And that takes me to my third point, which is... Um, hope is a choice. Hmm. Hope is a choice. Now we talked about that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and resurrection is to give us hope, right? But we have to accept that hope, right? In Psalms 126, verses 5 through 6, and I'm reading the New King James Version, it reads, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Sheaves are, are a bundle of grain stalks that are put together, right? So sowing in tears. When I say sowing in tears, what do you think of? It makes me think of pain. It makes me think of trauma. It makes me think of disappointment, right? But yet, we're sowing in our disappointment. We're sowing in our grief. We're, so we're sowing in our discouragement. And to think about, when I think about how do you lose hope, right? In order to have lost hope, you must have, at somewhere down your journey, had a, a place of disappointment. Right? You've hit a place of disappointment. And what I wanted to encourage you to do is even if you are in a place of grief, to still believe where you are. If I had to make it an equation, I would say grief 
plus belief in God equals hope. Right? Still believing what he says. And then it, the verse says, he who continually goes forth, continually, the sorrow has not stopped. The tears have not stopped. But he's persevering through what has happened. So that means to, the focus here is on continue to press forward. Even in your pain, even in your loss, even in your discouragement, even in disappointment, continue to press forward. Because joy, you will eventually reap joy. Jesus will be with us in our sorrow. We have to get to the point that no matter what happens in our lives, we won't give up on God. We're not going to always have this beautiful choir that just sang behind us. Pastor may not be able to call you directly when you're going through something, right? The deaconess may not always be able to be there in your home. But you get to a point where you got to encourage yourself. We got to pick this Bible up and read it for ourselves and remember how faithful God was to the people in the Bible and to you. I see beautiful faces of all ages. You still here. That means God's still showing up for you. So you remember the faithfulness of God, no matter where you are today, that Jesus is with you. He's with you in the difficult days and in the good. And sometimes we have to sit in the disappointment. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. But there, there is healing in recognizing where you are. There's healing in our tears and just acknowledging that it does hurt, right? And my encouragement to you is to find people who you can be vulnerable with. Find people who you can share that you are in pain with. Folks that'll make that space for you. And you can stay there for a little bit, but don't stay in the sorrow too long, right? If we, if we stay in the place of sorrow too long, it can give weight to depression, right? So we wanna, we wanna move, give yourself time, but then move. Continue to press forward. And sometimes we need help from professionals. We may need to go to a therapist, right? So I, I, the, and they, when she read my bio, thank you so much. I have a master's in social work. What does that mean? I train social workers and I train therapists. I absolutely believe in Jesus and therapy, okay? You pray and you go to therapy. We do both so we can get out of that place of darkness. Um, and you may need to cry, and that's okay. But my encouragement then for you is, after you've done crying, wipe your face, get up, and go. Continue to go forward. Joy will come in the morning. Hope is available to all of us. We choose hope by focusing on God's faithfulness, looking for opportunities of gratitude in our lives, we choose hope by remembering what God has done for us and for others. We should wait with anticipation that he will answer us. And lastly, we choose hope by being willing to be vulnerable in our pain and in our sorrow, pressing forward toward the harvest that awaits us on the other side of our tears. I leave you with this question. Will you choose hope today? Thank you. Salvation will help you a whole lot more than if you don't have it. You need salvation. Put the help in order. Go to the Lord first. If you've never asked the Lord, if you've never come to the Lord and said, Lord, I am human. No, I am imperfect. I have messed up enough for I don't need anybody to tell me I have. God, forgive me. Save me. Show me how to live. And if you haven't made the decision to give your life over to the Lord and to follow the example set forth in Scripture, you need to do that. We're giving you that invitation to do that. If there's someone here today that needs to say, 
Lord God, I have never taken time where I actually said, forgive me for my sins. Save me and show me how to live. You're welcome to do that now. Just come forward. It might look frightening. You might think, is she talking to me? Come forward. I don't see anybody else coming forward. But if God is speaking to you, then you listen to the voice of God. It is not the devil that will tell you to come forward for salvation. Romans 3.23 say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 10 teaches us all we have to do is say it. God save us. The doors of the church are open also for those who have already asked for salvation. But you need a church home. Come. You're welcome here. We will love you. And you will get encouraged. God teaches us not to forsake the assembling together. If we believe, well, I've gotten saved. I don't need to come forward. I don't need to join church. That's not true. God wants you with a body of believers. If everyone here has already accepted the Lord, if everyone here has salvation, praise God. Praise God. If you're online and you're like, well, I need it, please put, put that message in the chat. I will contact you. So since I don't have anyone walking forward, if you feel like, wow, I missed my moment and you still need to let me know after church, let me know. But this is the time where you tell everyone I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's, that's the walking forward part. So don't be afraid of that. We will celebrate you and in the heavens they rejoice. Okay, thank you. You may be seated.